Buju Tansegia. Hey, how are you? It's a smudge for your thoughts. With Kahiasis. <laughs> and Zosha. So on today's episode, we have a couple awesome guests. John Pepion and Sarah Agaton House. Yeah, we have some really interesting uh, topics that we talk about. We talk about their art. We talk about what they're doing uh, and how they're navigating through this uh, colonized space. Yeah. Um, Just like on every episode. <laughs> <laughs> but it's really a, a nice conversation. Um, we have some nice laughs and some really uh, powerful topics that we cover. So um, just listen and Hope you enjoy. enjoy. Yep. Peace. <laughs> welcome to a smudge for your thoughts welcome, and welcome. uh thank you for being here uh, we're so excited to talk to you yeah, guys yeah. <laughs> so oh uh, we'll start this out by Asking, what is your name, uh, where are you from, and how do you ident- identify yourself, like your tribe, nation, citizen of, or... However else, yeah. yeah however else you identify yourself. Go ahead, John. <laughs> um, my name is John Isaiah Pepion. Uh, I identify, identify myself as uh, Amska Pupukani, which is... Um, uh, I'm part of the Blackfeet Nation in Montana, also part of the Blackfoot Confederacy. I live in Montana, and that's where I'm coming from right now, live. Sweet. Thank you, John. Buju and Anishinaabe duk, and now kwe gizhi go kwe indigo. Megazine and dudem, papash kame te gung and dunjaba, guaba igening, inda, Sarah Agaton House, and Dijna Ka Jaganashi Mon, Hartberry, and Dananoki. So I said I'm from Fond du Lac. I live in the village of Sawyer, I'm Eagle Clan. Um, I told you my Anishinaabe name, but also that my English name is Sarah and I work for Hartberry. Awesome. You own Hartberry. Not only work for it. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're your own boss. <laughs> <laughs> like you say, you work for it. Like <laughs> She the owns owner. it. The She's owner. the owner. Yeah. She's a no, boss. <laughs> that's the interesting thing when we say things in our language that... um. Uh-huh. Like the way that I don't oh, okay. like I work I work for this or I work towards it versus okay. um that I own it. Titles are interesting, right? Because I have a hard time giving myself a title because uh there's so much inside words and titles. And yeah. so it's a, it's that's an interesting I never thought about that, but yeah. I, I call really you an artist, even though you won't say you're an artist. I call you an artist. You don't say you're an artist, Sarah? Um, I do call myself, I think, an artist now. I think calling okay. yourself. Said, I think. <laughs> like <laughs> calling yourself an artist feels like it's almost like calling yourself a runner, calling yourself an entrepreneur. Like it's a title that gets scary to say because yeah. you're you're really owning yourself mm-hmm. as a person. And so I'm gonna take that challenge, John. Okay. I'm an artist okay. and I work for Harberry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one step at a time. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> um, John, do you have a company that you like run? I I know you have a website, but do you like have a company? Is it just John Pepion Art or? Uh, uh, yes, uh, John Isaiah Pepion and John Isaiah Pepion dot com is my small business. Okay, cool, cool. That's what I. And, and uh, it is it, it is a small business, and this is going on my third year, and. Uh, so uh, main, mainly focusing on uh, sales through my website, but I do a lot of uh, commission work, yeah. murals and, and, and custom custom um, portrait, uh, not portraits, but custom pieces. Nice. Cool. Nice. So that kind of dives into our, yeah. like our our next question, which is what do you do for a living? Your, Your passions, passions and, hobbies. and hobbies. Yeah. Go, go ahead, sir. <laughs> we already um, talked about it, but... <laughs> Well, at Heartberry, uh, probably what I do is about um, a big part of what I do is cultural art. So, in a normal in a normal time frame, I would be teaching a lot of moccasin and beadwork classes and creating tools for people to do cultural art. That's a really big part of what I normally would be doing, um, and I really love that part of my work. 
and really miss that right now <laughs> a lot. Um, doing a Zoom class is just not the same. And then I do a third, I'll probably about a third of custom art, like logos, that kind of um, custom art for like tribes and organizations. And then a third is running the day-to-day Heartberry um, shipping and creating art and um, working with the Inspired Natives Project. So both John and I work with the Inspired Natives Project, which is part of Eighth Generation um, mm-hmm. and have uh, mentorship and development and business capacity building through that project. And that's been a big part of how my work has shifted from doing, I used to do like custom one-off yeah. bee work and art, and art for people and really was like, you know, like that girl at the Powell who's walking around with like yeah. her cardboard or her like her little box or whatever. Uh-huh. So like that was me. Yeah. Um, but as soon as I started doing that, the capacity, like so many people wanted that work yeah. that it really grew really quickly. And that's when I started doing more teaching. Um, but I've been working with um, eighth generation for s- over six, about six and a half years now. And um, that's just completely transformed my work from like a one off, like hustling, like work, like hustle, 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 mm-hmm. staying up all night beating to just not even be able to buy my kids snow pants to be able to actually like make a living and pay employees. And um, awesome. so it's completely transformed my entire life, really. It's that's like amazing. shocking. But hobbies, um, I'm a runner. So I Ooh. organize a group of Native women runners called the Play Pack. So we run together everything from 5Ks to 100 mile trail races. So I'm a runner. Um, and mostly now I hang out with my kids all the time. They're super awesome. Aww. So that's a big part of what I do now. And just trying to look, be, I'm like an active learner. So I always want to learn. And so I'm like, oh, let's learn how to like cut up this deer. <laughs> let me like, That's... let me get inside the deer and like see where the stuff is attached and like figure out how to do. I feel like that's a big part of what our job is of our generation is to make those connections that were kind of severed for us. So I work really hard on doing a lot of that. I love that because, yeah, we are really separated in this generation from our food. And I know that's, you know, for uh for like a native culture, it's like really important. I mean, for ed- everyone, it's really important to be more connected to your food. So it's really cool that you're doing that because I still have the heebie-jeebies sometimes when I try to <laughs> cut open something. Because <laughs> I got a whole chicken one time on accident and I didn't realize I had got, had the, like, had the organs still in it. I was like, oh, I don't know what to do with this. <laughs> <laughs> so that's awesome. Um, really quick too, before we jump to John, um, you have a, you organize a group of native runners, like women, native runners. That's super cool because, um, what was it called again? The Quay Pack. So Quay okay. is woman in Ojibwe. Okay. And so it's like pack of women. Quay Pack. I love that. Um, because that's something that's important to kind of talk about. I think that a lot of the outdoor industry is kind of you know, white centric, not, you know, you know, non-native at least. Um, and it's important to know that like native people and other brown people and, you know, black people, BIPOC people are into outdoors and into running, especially native cultures where, you know, you're much more generally more connected to, um, you know, your traditions that, which are linked to nature. Um, and it's kind of weird that a lot of outdoor companies like are not featuring more native people. So it's really cool that you're, you know, I think it's good to like really uh, organize that kind of thing because I think that a lot of native people probably feel like left out of outdoor activities. Yeah, it's kind of ironic. Yeah, right, right yeah, yeah. Um, but I think that that's it goes both ways. Um, and this could be its whole own podcast, but um, that like <laughs> when we, we are running and we're outside and we're, we feel safe and we feel like the places we go are where we belong. Mm -hmm. That's a big part of like our feeling free and our liberation and part of breaking out of the mold of what we're told. Um, Like, should we be out in, on these trails all over the place? Like, absolutely. That's where we belong. That's where native people belong. And that's, those are our homelands. And so we should be out there, but that's like a whole mind shift you know? And so, yeah, that could be his whole own podcast. Yeah, anyway. yeah, seriously. No, it could. But so I just wanted to talk about how I lo- love that you're organizing that and you guys are doing that. So, all right, John, your turn. Um, <laughs> uh, Sarah's very humble and uh, she probably wouldn't mention this, but 
I think it was this year or the end of last year, her running group got to run alongside Oprah. Really? Really? <laughs> that is amazing. I think I saw it. Wasn't she like wrapped in your blanket? Is that the picture I saw or is that someone else's? <clears throat> no, that she, they contacted us and okay. said like, we, you know, Oprah's on this tour. We want to feature groups who are really trying to live a healthy lifestyle and changing their communities and we think what you're doing they brought us down there it was like that vip so cool. like doors like hotel rooms we're all like we're just like a bunch of girls from the res and you're like giving Oprah. us hotel rooms like are you gonna murder us What's happening <laughs> and Oprah it's like loves to do that like surprise thing so yeah. i knew she was coming but no one else in the group could know because she wants to do the surprise so mm -hmm. like i'm like exploding and she like i had to keep it a secret and we all go down there and she comes around the corner and there's a really great video of it. I'll have to send you like her coming around. Everyone. Oh freaks my out. God. That would yeah. be such a hard secret to hold in. <laughs> That's but, uh, really cool. I'll tell you what, uh, working with eight generation and, and the staff, um, we learn to be very top secret. There's a lot of great projects, a lot of great mm -hmm. stuff happening right now. <laughs> and, and, uh, so yeah, as a as a uh, indigenous entrepreneur, as you're working and as you're as you're planning ahead, sometimes it could take two to three years for something to plan. And when I first started out, I never had the patience. I wanted things to happen right now. So in 2009 is when I when I decided like I wanted to pursue art, and uh, I made that decision that I didn't want to work no more because at the time. Um, I had I had my daughter and she was a, a toddler at the time and I couldn't find a job and I worked so many odd jobs. I worked uh, a graveyard shift security, weird security, odd jobs. And I was living in Santa Fe, New Mexico at this time and Taos, Pueblo and uh, working at Walmart, uh, graveyard shift stocking. I even worked as a, um, a waiter and made like to something an hour. And uh, so with all that, I learned how to be more humble and uh, communicate more, especially as a waiter, waiting on people. And and, and uh, before that, I would be more of the stoic, silent warrior guy sitting in the back, don't bother me. Mm -hmm. So I start drawing and doing these drawings and, and I was selling them for cheap $20 just to feed my family. Um, and uh, I think about it now, I know some of the people and they got away with some great drawings for like $20 at the time. See, at that time, I didn't know my worth. Yeah. So now it's 2020. Um, I, I've been a full-time artist since those times. And I went through so many struggles and climbs and highs and lows. Um, at one time, I thought that the gallery model was the way to be our, our markets. Like I thought Santa Fe and the market was the ultimate thing to be. I got denied like three times um i've been denied a, a lot of things so many times but i never stopped it never stopped me so being denied and learning i had to um create my own lane mm -hmm. and then um moving back to montana and being very desolate uh, i had to uh um just keep pushing no matter what and uh so i went through this period of being a full-time artist that way and now in 2020 um I got the small business that is is thriving, and I want to. Uh, I always tell Sarah that she she's a, a, a inspiration and goals because I would love to have my own uh, space like she does, uh, a, a small warehouse, and, and you know I hope to hire a couple employees. You know, being where I'm from, it's like eighty percent unemployment, but that's a lot of places. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm also blessed and fortunate enough to where I'm, I'm making a major um, transition in my life. Uh, in January, I'll be a full-time art teacher at a high school. Ooh, that's cool. That's awesome. What uh, that that school is super lucky. Like you know, like seriously, you have someone that's such you know you're an iconic artist. You know, you're on featured on Eighth Generation Blankets, and your ledger art is super super good. Like you're very. I mean, you know, you're talented. You know, you're worth now. Um, hopefully, but uh, so that's really awesome. Like you know, to be one of those students is pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. Your, your, and your story is like, so, uh, powerful. Yeah. Uh, that you just are never given up. And, uh, that's a really good uh, lesson for people. Yeah. I mean, people, uh, could look up to you. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, going to, whenever I was in college at the university of Montana, I was 
I I heard about like your artwork and I I yeah. I, I knew uh I whenever your name popped up here yeah I, I was like I was like I, I know that name from somewhere yeah. where, where do I know it so uh I'm I'm really honored to like have you on our podcast Seriously. and talking to you now because uh I really love your art and I I I you're definitely a uh, someone because I mean I I love doing art too so um but. Like, this is a really powerful. Thank you for sharing your story to, for, uh, to us. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, both of you. Are really, mm -hmm. Like, when Sarah invited you, I was like, oh, my gosh, he's, like, a super iconic artist for, like, ledger art. So, and uh, Sarah's woodland, you know, floral style is super iconic, too. Like, I'm, I'm just super ecstatic to be talking to you guys. Um, so, thank you again. So, uh did you want to ask anything specific before we move on to the next question? Yeah, okay. <laughs> so um, we kind of talked about it, I think. But um, so what inspires you guys to do, you know, to do this art and to do the work of, you know, you know, educating people through the art and everything and um, other hobbies that you do? You want to go first? Go <laughs> I guess. Next time I'm going to tell us. <laughs> we're both. We're both. I know you both are like waiting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I guess, I guess I could go first. Yeah, since Sarah you asked. Um, you can never uh, tell a, an, an indigenous woman. No. So I better start talking. now. <laughs> um, I guess um, for me personally, for what I do, what inspires me is, is being from um, my community and being based out of my community is a blessing. A lot of people feel that they have to move to certain areas to thrive, especially in the arts, you know? And um, so I'm blessed to be where I'm at and in my community and learning uh, my culture. And uh, since the pandemic, I always been telling people, even on social media, that this is the time, this is, this is the perfect time to learn your language, to learn your culture. And, and so with that, um, uh, like, like Sarah said, uh, I consider myself, and a lot of people consider myself a community-based artist. Mm -hmm. And uh, lately I've been doing uh, a lot of mur mural work and a lot of my art consists of, uh, of how we're living now as indigenous people, also being influenced by the past. Um, a lot of my artwork is based upon uh, my personal experience, our, our, our past experience of, of warriors and family members still telling these stories through art. Um, a lot of my art is based off of uh, uh, the, um, the pictographic art that was on, on the rocks, the rock paintings, the rock carvings, to the hide art, to the winter counts telling stories. I'm still continuing that tradition. I could trace back my family to some winter counts in the National Museum of American Indian. And I'm fortunate enough to know who I am and where I'm from. So I always tell people that it's never too late to learn who you are. And a lot of my art is based on identity. And the reasons that why I say identity, because we have all these um, non-Indigenous people and institutions telling us who we are. But I always tell people it's time for us to take control, take control of the narrative and tell the people who we are. And that's what my purpose is. I'm telling the world who I am and who we are right now. That's amazing. Yeah, that's super important to uh, really set your own identity, like put your own um, narrative forth. And yeah. What's going on? What? Something's just going on. Okay. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Um, our, our landlords, our, our landlord is coming over to clean our gutters out today. So I think that might be them. So anyway, <laughs> um, no, thank you so much for sharing. That's really important. Like I said, um, uh, to, like I said, to put your own identity forth, like rather than having other like non-indigenous people or other institutions tell you who you are. And then, um, the fact that you're able to trace your, like, your lineage back to some of the winter counts that are in like museum, like you said, that's super, so cool because like, I, um, like I, you know, a lot of people, um, indigenous, non-indigenous, like can't trace themselves more, more indigenous people can trace their heritage back. Um, but it, so it's really special to be able to do that. So, um, that's really cool. It's like know where you're yeah. from, you know? 
And you said that uh, your uh, your your art is uh, really uh, goes uh, to your identity. Um, could you explain uh, that a little bit further? Like I I know that. Uh, uh, so so for example, um, when you see my work, uh, you you know that it's Blackfeet. You know that I'm Blackfeet, especially if you are Blackfeet or or as we say, Natitipi, um, because. Blackfeet were also part of the Blackfoot Confederacy, which goes up into Canada. There's Kainai, Siksika, and Pukuni, and I'm Amskapi Pukuni. And uh, so when people see my art, they could typically identify it as Blackfeet. And, and uh, that's always been a, a goal of mine to, to get things right, to get our designs right, to get everything right and correct and learn. And, and, and it's been a process. So with this process growing up, um, my grandfather and, and family members were artists that come from a huge art family, but I never thought like, oh, look at me, I'm going to be an artist. Like I tried to deny it for years. Um, yeah, but I'm now I'm, I'm proud. I embrace it. I tell people I'm an artist. Um, so identity uh, is, is, is just reclaiming, reclaiming a lot of things. Like this is the time now that we are taking things back that was taken from us, our language, our designs, um, our ceremonies, uh, they're alive and well. And, and I like to demonstrate that through my art because my art is, uh, a lot of indigenous art has like a collective spirit, meaning it's alive and things mean something. And I also see my artwork personally as cultural preservation. Like I'm trying to preserve what's going on right now for future generations. Like I feel it's very important and I don't, because we're still, even though things are thriving and we're reclaiming, we're still losing things. And uh, so, that's what I mean by identity. Like you could tell um, specifically uh, Blackfeet and from a certain area and uh, and uh, just happy to share anything with anybody, share my knowledge. Yes, nice. Thank you for explaining that. It's really amazing. Um, so Sarah, what inspires you? I think there's a couple of ways that I could answer this question, but um, <laughs> the the way that I was taught about our designs and where our art comes from is that it's meant to teach and remind us about the medicines and foods that are around us. And so even if you look at old like bandolier bags, they have designs on them that are meant to remind us about who we are. And so they're beautiful. Like our designs are beautiful and you can look and say, oh, that's really pretty. But the other part of it is that during the time when our way of life was really outlawed, people would make these designs and put them on there as a reminder. And so it's this really interesting covert sort of like, hey, remember this plant, you're gonna need to remember this later. And I think that that is a big part of what I think about when I'm making art now is what do I want people to remember and be reminded of? So I do that for myself as much as anybody else that I need to be reminded about operating from my heart. I need to be reminded about our seasonal way of life. I need to be reminded to move my body, like all those things. I need to be reminded of all those things. And so I really take from that, like I really like come from that place with my art. But the other part, and I think that's what I'm really missing right now is I really, um, I'm a community organizer by trade like by training that's a big part of who I who I am mm -hmm. is about the community and about what do we where are we going as a community and um I've had like so many amazing teachers and really think that a big part of what my job is is to transfer what I've learned to other people like to give those gifts willingly to me cultural art is a gift and so I was given so many gifts that my job is to give that gift again and I really take that really seriously that that's my role. I'm real clear about it now. Yeah. Like I'm 44. I'm like, okay, I, I know, I know yeah. now like what I'm supposed to be doing. And um, there's like this really amazing part of people um, in moxing classes who most of our people in our community had did not grow up doing any of these kind of cultural art class, this kind of work. So mm -hmm. people come into these classes with all kinds of feelings about them, their identity, about their self as a Anishinaabe person. They come in with all this stuff 
anger, grief, mm -hmm. loss, rage, like you name it. Mm -hmm. And they're in there and they're like, I'm never going to be able to do this. And so they're trying and trying and they're poking themselves and they're bleeding on it. And it's, <laughs> it's, this, it's a whole like thing yeah. because it's not like, a, it's not like people don't come into this. Like, it's not like a make or take night. Like this is like them, this is their identity. So they're working on it and they're sewing the moccasins inside out. And then there's this point where they flip them right side out and they look at it and like the look on their face is so incredible because at that moment they realized that they all the things that they thought were lost there they have like made that connection between themselves and like their grandma or their great grandma that that whole that line of connection is not lost and there's so much in that I can see the transformation and I remember that for myself and I, I get to be a part of that part of people's lives over and over and over again. It's like, I love following, like, I call it like the high of cultural. Yeah. <laughs> so, I'm like, so I, that's a big part of what I love to do. And the other part is, is really like what John was talking about taking control of our narrative. So I get to do a lot of really cool, just like window projects, like creating a big like set of murals across windows. When you drive into Duluth, what you see is a bunch of Ojibwe designs and is, is really taking like, these are, these are our spaces. Mm -hmm. We've always been here. We're still here mm -hmm. and making it known that that is who, where that that's, this is whose land that we sit on, you know, mm -hmm. and really, um, that's a really important part of what I think, um, I get to do. But, um, and also what inspires me is my kids. So I have a 10 and a 13 year old and they're like, their life is so different <laughs> than, <laughs> than mine. Like in their, in their world, um, people run, they have businesses, they're artists, they go to college, like their life is so different and unbelievable. Like the, in, so in their mind, like what they can do with their life is just like wide open. Yeah. Like, and that's really amazing to me. That is amazing. Um, that's really true though. Like people are so much more like the role models for children now are so much more multidimensional, you know, like all these different things going on and so many different avenues you can go down, not just, pigeonholed into one you know one career path or whatever so that's really amazing and I think that's so cool that you get to experience the kind of transformation of people um going you know connecting back to their culture through like the mo you know when you do the moccasin classes making classes that's so amazing um because I mean that gave me chills because like when you can connect to like, I want that connection, you know, to my Polish roots. Like, that is amazing. So, um, I don't know. I, I'm I'm inspired by the fact that you're able to see that happen all the time with different people, you know, different groups of people. Yeah. And, the, I mean, the other part of, too, like, I should say what inspires me, really. Like, so, Louis has been my mentor for, like, over six years, Louis Gong. And, I mean, John can attest to this. Louis is an incredible mentor in the sense that he can see what you're capable of, but he's not going to let you fall shy of what you're capable of. And so he's always, like, pushing me to, like, you got to always be learning. You have to always be reinvesting in yourself. You have to always grow and always pushing me to be better and better and to really think about the future, to think big, to think visionary. And I don't know about you, about you but, like, for me... Part of um, like maybe it's a trauma response is not to plan, not to invest in myself. Um, like I'm like, I just got to like make the next hundred dollars to pay the propane bill instead of thinking about like, how, how do I reinvest in myself and not spend that hundred dollars and really put that back into my business or so like, I think there's a lot of things that I little things and big things I've learned and been inspired by, by Louie. I can, that is a whole own show too, but, um, that style of way of doing business where he really invests in us, but also it benefits everybody. I can see that. And I can replicate that in my business now. So that's a big part of like who I am at this point. I feel like that's super cool. It's, um, part of that mentorship, like with eighth generation, huh? Um, we were talking to Serene Lawrence yesterday, actually, and she was just talking about how, she just loves, you know, doing that, like being that, being able to 
inspire, you know, artists like yourself and John and to think big and, you know, really go for it. So I love that. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank yeah. you. Okay. Uh, I don't know if you had to so, oh, we could just, uh, I, I love like w what you guys are saying and talking, um, but, uh, and we could dive into so many different things that uh, you know, this, uh, podcast could go on for, for so long, uh, with, uh, the points that you guys have talked about, but yeah, uh, seriously, uh, I'm going to guide the questions along to our, our next question, which is, uh, uh, I mean, you've both touched on this, but, uh, how do you stay connected to your culture or what does it mean to you to be the different tribes that you guys are? Um, Anishinaabe and yeah. I'm Scott Pipikani. And I guess we could uh, have uh, Sarah start uh, because uh, John did the started the last one. So okay, <laughs> <laughs> um, I operate in the the way that who I am is an Anishinaabe person. That's who I am is Anishinaabe. So to me, I'm not. There's not a disconnection between culture, history the future, my homelands, that's I've, all of that as who I am. Mm -hmm. And so I really try to live my life that I'm operating on one path. I'm in one world. I'm not splitting myself between two worlds. I'm yeah. living on one path. Because when I think when, when we do that as native people, we, there's this whole dialogue about I have to live in two worlds. And I think that that's really difficult. Like when we go to college and we're like trying in, to me, I'm like, I'm going on one path. It's, I only have one life and one path to live. And so I'm going to try to, to live that in the most genuine way as an Anishinaabe that I can. Um, and I think that means different things for different people. But for me, it's about reconnection. It's about playing a role in my generation about building a bridge so that my kids their way of life is so normal like to them going to ceremonies cutting up a deer in the kitchen is like normal no, they don't think nothing of it my daughter goes to immersion school like it's just not it's just a normal day um and so I think that I really try to just live my life in that just that following that path like that and I grew up like super, like I grew up on the res, but it was, was very assimilated uh, Christian school, like the whole thing. And also like I'm mixed, like I have my parent, my mom is white and my dad is Anishinaabe, but I look at myself that I'm a Anishinaabe person because blood quantum and um, this whole like half breed complex thing, that's all colonial concepts. And so if I was born 200 years ago, I would just look at myself as an Anishinaabe person. This is where I live. This is what I do. This is how I operate. Um, I don't teach my kids that they're part this, part that. I'm like, this is who you are. And so that's just, I just try to live my life as genuinely as I can and um, connect as much as I can and make all those connections and um, always learn. Just like always, always, always learn. And my experience has been that when I ask people to teach me about something, they're genuinely so glad that I want to know. Like genuinely, like you actually want to learn about this, <laughs> that I very rarely run into elders or older people who don't want to teach me stuff. So I just keep asking, just keep trying to learn. These old guys, if you're like, hey man, can you show me how to like do this, cut, tap this tree? They're like, yes, here's all this stuff. <laughs> they like love it. They're like, this is fantastic. And so I just try to replicate that. Because they know you're someone who's going to, you know, pass that along. And, you know, if you're interested in it, they know you'll, you know, be able to pass that along and keep that going. So that's, yeah. that's awesome. That's cool. And I like that you talk about one path as opposed to, because I know that that dialogue of like walking in two worlds and I've kind of referenced that, but I like that you, you know, you, you are Anishinaabe and that's who you are and everything that you do is along that one path. Um, that's really powerful. And I think I'm going to stop asking people <laughs> about like walking in two worlds because I like, you know, it should be one path, you know? I mean, I might be on, I'm sure that there's other native people who would disagree with me on this. Yeah. But I um, like that though. Like, and I mean, it doesn't mean that like my path is straight. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like it's all over. Uh -huh. And I know John could attest to that too. Like we go all over, uh <laughs> but that is still, I'm still that Yeah. no matter what. 
Mm -hmm. I'm still, I'm still, that's still with me no matter what. And so that's a really important part of, of our way of life is just being able to come back to that. Yeah. Over and over. Yeah. That you touched on our, like kind of our next question there. True. Yeah. So uh, we'll come back to that. But uh, uh, John, could we have you answer the question, please? What was the question again? So. <laughs> <laughs> um, how do you stay connected to your culture? Uh, or what does it mean for you to be um, Scott B. Pakani? Um, let's see. For me personally, like, I, I don't speak for like every. Yeah person in my community and, and when I say community um also multiple communities but the the community where I'm specifically from is called Birch Creek and um and a lot of the families in this area we're all related and uh could trace our roots to certain people certain certain um certain bands certain families and so the place that we live in now like I live right next to my brother and his wife, like not even far. They always joke around about having a zip line to their house because we live right next to each other. But we're out in the countryside where it's very private and very quiet. And then my mother and um, stepfather live not too far from us. And my aunt and a couple of cousins live by us. So um, we all we all have that family structure. I'm fortunate enough to grow up with that family structure. Um, of celebrating birthdays and, 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 and certain certain um, certain holidays like Thanksgiving, like we ain't celebrating Thanksgiving as um, as as uh, I don't know how people say more of like a colonized thing. We celebrate it as a, a family coming together and and of course eating. Like my family um, comes from old. Um, like the old cowboy ranch lifestyle. So they have all these family recipes handed down, homemade pies, homemade everything. Like I love my mother's cooking. So basically why I bring all that up is the family structure and how we celebrate things as a family. Um, this land that we're living on now, um, we could we could trace my family specifically living here for over well over a hundred years, even before that, even back in the days to the band camped in this area. So T- being tied to the land is 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 a is a true um, uh, helps me be connected to my culture, knowing who my who I am from the people I come from, and then um, uh, growing up, uh, my grandfather spoke her language fluently, but my grandfather and uh, my grandmother were uh, in boarding schools, so they grew up um, kind of like. Uh, it was it was it wasn't okay to share our our, our culture and knowledge because of what they w- went through, um, and so they were more focused on education, and 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 uh, a lot of indigenous people still are like they want people to be doctors and lawyers go to, go off to school and come back, but you know we we leave uh, we go get educated we come back, but we always have to deal with. Um, lower pay scales than what we would do uh all these uh politics on on our native homelands and and i give people props that are lawyers and doctors and educated still here uh for our people like we are truly dedicated to our people and our culture and our youth and uh so uh for me what makes me be pakani is uh being tied to the land one second our language uh, third our ceremonies and and four family uh i don't speak my language fluently i have a certain understanding but i'm willing to learn um i don't have long hair i say i wear my braids on the inside oh. and and uh but uh, i love who i am and where i'm from and uh, that that there's people to ask and just like sarah said no matter what, just ask because people are always willing to share their knowledge that's how i'm learning that's how i still learn i, I just ask yeah. yeah, and that's something that's really important uh, that we bring up uh, a lot in our podcast is that uh, we're as we as indigenous people are so open uh, to teaching people. If you just ask and you ask in the proper way uh, and you be respectful about it, um, like uh, Sophie, she's uh, she's white, and whenever she came back to the res, 
like she asked a bunch of questions and so many people were like open uh, to answering those questions uh, about our ceremonies and things. Uh, my family in particular, because that's, uh, yeah. One thing that I didn't ask and then um, was pretty funny is, um, well, it's not funny that we were at a funeral, but um, they were passing around the grease and I thought that I was supposed she to take a big spoon. She thought it was like pudding or uh, something. She grabbed a, a huge spoonful. Like my mom Dad's and like, I, no. everybody was like looking at her like, whoa. <laughs> They're like, take a spoonful of everything. So I just like, like a huge spoonful. I don't remember if I ate it or she, not. She she did. She, <laughs> and I was yeah. like, I don't know. I probably made a face. I don't yeah, remember exactly. So. But um, so yeah, it's pretty funny. Um, So you learn. By doing yeah. and asking, I guess, sometimes. Oh. <laughs> that just reminded me of that, that when you said that. <laughs> that that, that reminds me of, a, of, of a, a couple of years ago, I went up to Juneau, Alaska, and I uh, spent about a week up there and uh, connected with another artist there. And uh, she invited us <clears throat> to a homemade traditional meal of some of the traditional foods. I don't know if it was specifically a traditional meal, but she uh, made seal that she killed uh, harvested uh, seaweed that she made, um, moose, salmon. And then while she was preparing this meal for a small group of us at her, at her brother's house, she uh, brought out this jar and uh, she's telling us it was fermented, uh, I think it was fermented uh, f uh, whale fat into a, into a liquid. And she had to smell it and it didn't smell too good. <laughs> And, and 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 she said that they give it to she was Tlingit and she said that they give it the runners take it they'll take it in the mornings and they'll make them run like give them energy but okay. she she would on her food that that when we ate with her she put it on everything like a drizzle mm -hmm. and and uh sorry about that okay. um, okay. I had a phone call okay. um, but anyways uh she she come up to me and there was a spoon in there and and, and uh, she took that spoon and just shoved it in my mouth didn't even give me a chance to <laughs> anything and so that's what that reminded me of like that spoon of grease but yeah I took a spoonful of that fermented fat and uh, yeah did it um taste all right it was different okay to, I guess yeah. yeah did it give you a lot of energy too I don't know I just thought mm, I didn't even have a chance to really tell think yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like um. Yeah, I was gonna. Yeah, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, me. <laughs> that's something that's uh, super important to to bring up as well. Is that we uh, as indigenous people don't know like the ceremonies and we don't know all the uh, customs and traditional meals and different things of other indigenous cultures. Like, and they're not that, all the same. Yeah, we're not all the same. So I mean, that's thanks for bringing that up because uh, uh, that's something that's super important to. Uh, to educate people on is like, I, I know my culture. I don't know yours. Uh, we have, I mean, and if we do, uh, just like you were saying earlier that you, uh, are part of, uh, uh, the Blackfeet, that's, uh, it's part of the Blackfoot Confederacy, but it's different than, uh, like the blood reservation. It's different than, uh, other reservations up, up North, uh, uh, like Siksika and, uh, all of those up there that, I mean, you guys are part of the same confederacy, but you guys have different art. You guys have uh, different uh, customs. Uh, they're, they may be similar, but it's it's different. And that's something that's super important to bring up. Like, uh, I, I'm oh, yeah. I, I'm also a, a Ojibwe, sorry. Uh, but uh, our, our Ojibwe uh, culture is uh, different than uh, Sarah's Ojibwe culture. How dare you bring that up as an afterthought? <laughs> I am offended. <laughs> Primary. Always Ojibwe first. Well, 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 uh, well, well, bring, well, well bringing that up, uh, uh, yes, I agree. Um, uh, uh, there's like uh, over 500 and like, I don't know, 70 federally recognized tribes in the United States, not including state recognized and not including the ones that are not recognized at all. Mm. We all speak different languages and different foods and customs and uh, we're not the same and uh, even though I'm Blackfeet, even though on my reservation in Montana, 
we're not all the same. Not everybody's doing ceremonies or speaking our language. Pe people are, are into Catholicism, Christians, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. And, and I'm not going to force anything on anybody and, and people have the choice to be who they want to be nowadays and that's 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 what um especially with technology with youth youth can be anything nowadays anything look at all these tiktok stars going on look yeah at, look, look at uncle with cranberry juice <laughs> house. dog face so, so um so like uh yeah so when it comes to like the uh, blackfoot confederacy we speak the same language and share a lot of um ceremony customs but yeah we are different and even here in montana there's different uh bands and families scattered and we're not all the same um and uh in in the blackfeet of montana and the the blackfoot confederacy in canada we we, we speak uh, uh different dialects like like the blackfeet are the blackfoot in canada tell us in montana that we speak new blackfeet oh. while in canada they speak old black Old, old, the older language, and what they mean with us, they say we speak too fast oh, and have words right. for like computer and everything. So, um, and uh, if you think about it, the the Anishinaabe or, or or I don't know how some some say Chippewa, some say Ojibwe, and some don't even like those words. Like you guys are are huge, huge people scattered throughout Canada and the United States. Also, uh, yeah, uh, it's crazy because in the past. Uh, couple of years being out in Seattle and working with a generation and being, I didn't know that most of everybody in Washington, not everybody a lot, that they're all, they're all Salish. I thought they're all different, mm. but they're all Salish. You know, I never knew that. Yeah. I never would have thought of that. I didn't know that either. <laughs> so, that's... Yeah. Like all the groups around Seattle, like I thought they were all different, but no, they're all Salish speaking people. Okay. But like different, you know, probably have different uh, yeah. customs and stuff. That's, yes. that's interesting. Um, but I, that's really important, though, like to note that, you know, like all different, uh, like like you speak new Blackfeet and there's the older Blackfeet and there's just all different customs and languages and uh, traditions. So, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, in our, our tribe, we have uh, we have Chippewa and Cree speakers. Uh, actually, no, sorry, we have. One, I think we have one Ojibwe uh, speaker left uh, in our on our reservation, and and we have a a different dialect than uh, the other Ojibwe's, and we have a lot of affluent Cree speakers. Uh, it's starting to pick back up, but we do as well have a different dialect than up north, and our our language has been kind of commingles with uh, Ojibwe. So we have like similar words that kind of go back and forth. So, yeah, that. Mm -hmm. um, you said that because uh, what was the word? Um, Kisakitin and then. Um, Dizagin. Yeah, they're su super similar. Yeah. Anyway. Um, for I love you. Oh, yeah. So um, anyway, we can <laughs> move on to the next question. <laughs> Um, so, um, this is, you know, kind of similar to what we've asked already, but, um, oh, did you already ask that one? No. Okay. No. <laughs> um, I get lost with the questions too. How do you navigate through this colonized world, you know, that we live in this colonized space with your, uh, customs or your culture in mind in order to succeed in your, you know, in your life, like in your job, in your field? in your art Sarah <laughs> <laughs> so right I you know um I always like bring a lot of things back to Louis but I was a fan of like followed Louis's work before I ever met him and so I would watch like he used to like do like skate parks with the youth and had this interesting way of combining cultural art business and community Mm -hmm. And I think it was a model that I had never seen, but it really resonated with me like right away. I was like, that's the way that I want to operate. I want to, I want to combine these ways of, of being that we can be contemporary people and we can still be people that are rooted. We can, we get to do all those things. Mm -hmm. And I think like, I really feel that we've always been people who've adapted and then lived in the, like this confluence of, 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 um, 
of different ways of living. And so like, I think about the cast iron kettle and it's a really great representation to me of like, I imagine the first Ojibwe woman who saw a cast iron kettle was like, oh my gosh, that's awesome. <laughs> I want one of those. She wasn't like, oh no, I, that's not traditional. I don't yeah. want that cast iron kettle. But right. she was like, I'm going to take that cast iron kettle and I'm going to do what I do with it even better. Yeah, And so there, there's this way that we can still be who we are right now with who we've been. And so I don't think that like, we don't have to, I don't have to come to ride to work on a horse <laughs> in order to be, though I want to ride to work on a horse, I think that would be dope. <laughs> that like, we get to be all those people. So when I go like talk to student groups and like, and especially like in town, they'll be like, oh, well, do you have like electricity at your house? <laughs> and I'm like, the cool thing about being an Anishinaabe is that I get to be all those things. Yeah. So I get to have ceremonies. I get to have another language. I get to have another way of thinking. I get to have this whole history, but I also get to have an iPhone. Yeah. Right. Like I get to, I, it's not that, so it's a difference between thinking about those things as being attention versus thinking of those things as being like this incredible way that I get to pick and choose what my cast iron kettles are going to be. Yeah. And, um, that has been, um, for me, a helpful transformation is like, okay, I can think more of like, I like that I can design something on a computer and I can print it up. It can cover an entire billboard with like this cool, like rolled out material. Like, I think that's awesome. That Yeah. Because it's this confluence, right? And I, mm -hmm. and I get to do both of those things. So I really like that. Um, and I think that all of those ways of operating have value. And we don't have to be stuck anywhere. We get right. to be wherever we want to be. Right. And I think that's a freedom versus a, it being um, a detriment. Perfect. I love that. Yeah. Um, like you can use the technology, any technology that any other contemporary person is using to make what you do easier or like better or, you know, so. Yeah. But even, you know, I think that like with the business and with like making blankets um, that these are gifts that are super important in our community from everything mm -hmm. from babies being born, ceremonies, weddings, whatever. And I think that if we don't have native people doing this work, you're going to have non-native people stealing our art and doing and doing it. So like we need to be doing it yeah. because otherwise yeah. someone else is going to be stealing our art and doing it. Yeah. And that's where I think like, it's okay for us to be in, in to, 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 be, to pick our cast iron kettle. Yeah. Yeah. I like I that think. analogy. I do too. I, that's a cool analogy. Thank you. Um, so like, uh, being like an indigenous person nowadays and navigating navigating in today's world and being a, a a small business entrepreneur it's almost like um i feel like you got to be like a chameleon you got to be willing to adapt to anything especially in these times now like when 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 this pandemic hit you see a lot of small business die businesses closing uh, people having hard times and these are very hard times for everybody not just indigenous people but um, anybody you know a lot of people are going through this sickness um, depression uh, some people are having a hard time providing for their families and me can't even get a job because of the restrictions in certain areas communities our cities uh, for example we've been on lockdown in a reservation since march um, I haven't been able to go to um, any art receptions or any any art. I think I did three art exhibits, but I haven't been to none or anything. And and I'm okay with that. I, I adapted to that. Like it's to the point now where um, I don't want to. I don't want to. I'm okay with not doing art shows or art markets. It's that's not what I'm about um, because I got the small business in this e-commerce that. I'm starting to thrive and, and I'm fortunate for that, but it took like years of planning and, 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 and patience and learning and, and uh, willing to adapt and willing to learn. And, and um, uh, me personally, like my community this summer, they turned to a lot of, it seemed uh, art, 
So this summer I jumped into doing murals and I never did murals in my life. And now I'm on my fifth mural right now. Um, and it's been, it's been a, a great experience. Uh, I see art as uh, therapy and healing. I think if I wasn't doing art, I'd probably be um, locked up or dead now because I grew up, uh, grew up uh, in, a, in a very uh, violent environment and, and full of alcoholism. And uh, so that's just part of me personally adapting and navigating in this world now because uh, I'll, I will be a year sober soon. Next month will be a year of sobriety for me. I, I, and I haven't been sober since I was like 13. And every every trouble or anything I've gotten in trouble or, or violence was all due to alcohol. But everybody has their own personal experience with what they do. So it, it was my choice. Uh, I just had like a, a wake up call, but it took tragedy to wake me up. And it seems like it takes a lot of tragedy to wake people up or something significant like this pandemic. Even though people are struggling and businesses are closing, I still see people rising. I see people thriving. You know, so I see indigenous people thriving. Even we always have to adapt as indigenous people through policies, force assimilation. Uh, we're still fighting for water. We're still fighting for land and, and we're never giving up. We're adapting and navigating. Yes, yes. That's super powerful. Like, I mean, I love everything that you guys are saying. <laughs> you guys are uh, great uh, speakers and everything. Um, but uh, not to get away from what you guys are said, uh, what you guys said, but we're going to move on to our last question, which is uh, what do you wish to let our audience know about your uh, tribe community or your final thoughts uh, you want to leave with our audience? I'm sad. That's the last question. <laughs> <laughs> we we just try to uh, keep uh, the interview around and uh, thirty minutes to an hour, and we're coming up uh, on an hour. I didn't even right realize now. it had gone by yeah. that fast. <laughs> it's, going, it's going by really fast. So, thanks okay. so much for all the. Uh, uh, I guess yeah. I guess I'll I'll start speaking. Okay. Um, it's uh, what I what I what I personally enjoy seeing right now in the moment that we're living is 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 younger people stepping up for leadership positions such as tribal council, yeah. such yeah. as uh, um, um, getting her master's degree, doctor's degree, educators. I give a huge uh, respect to educators, especially with uh, online distance learning. It's very challenging. There are a lot of students right now that have no access to internet or haven't even logged on to their class yet. Um, and so I know it's, challenging and, and, and community stepping up to feed our community. I see a lot of people bringing food to communities, houses, um, you know, it's Thanksgiving. So a lot of people in my community, different organizations in our tribe are preparing meals and, and turkey dinners to give to elders. And if people can't come pick them up, volunteers are driving these, these things out. So what I see right now is, is a lot of people working together so everybody can thrive, uh, whether it's having water, electricity, internet, food. And uh, so I want to leave people with a thought of uh, working together. It's better when you unite and work together in your community or with um, other indig indigenous people. So here's Louis Gong, a great mentor, has all these artists under his umbrella. And it's a great opportunity. We all learn from each other. and. Uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm Blackfeet, uh, Sarah's Anishinaabe, and there's others. There's um, there's uh, Akama Pueblo, there's um, other tribes, and, and it's great to be working together. And, and, and uh, um, so I see as, t as times right now, I think it's great to come together and, and help each other because um, these are challenging times. Like, we don't know what the future is or how it's going to be. Like, I'm enjoying this little push in my business right now but I don't really know how it's going to be. So I'm just like going to keep pushing forward no matter what. And I want to encourage everybody to um, never give up no matter what and to keep, uh, to keep going, like, like uh, try hard. Yeah. You are, you are a great role model for that to keep pushing and no matter what. So thank you for those words. 
Can you repeat the question? Um, just like, um, are your final thoughts that you want to leave the audience with? Oh my gosh. <laughs> Lots of <laughs> pressure. <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> um, so I'm not sure when this will air, but, um, you know, like I think a lot of people I've been riding the coaster through this and there's been like really hard times and really like incredible insights that I've gained through this experience. Mm -hmm. But uh, something that I've learned, I guess, in my life is that hardship does not mean that you should stop um, what you're doing. And in fact, that the only choices we have in hardship are like how we're going to respond to it. So we can't stop death and we can't stop. I mean, there's so many things we can't stop, but we can choose how we're going to pivot in, in those situations. And so um, really like for, for, for me, I've really like leaned into my family. I've really leaned into being outside. I've really leaned into my art. I really leaned into those things. Um, and I just believe in that when something is really hard, we can le glean lessons from it even though we don't want to. <laughs> and, yeah. and I don't, I don't want, I don't want anybody to have to be strong. I don't want anybody to have yeah. to be resilient, but you are, and we are, mm -hmm. and our ancestors have survived things that are way harder than what we're dealing with right now. And that, that is inside our DNA, like that part there in us. And so we are capable of so much more. And so I know, like, I really lean into that that they they're they're here and they're in me and what they've survived and i'm gonna just um really tap into that i love that again you gave me chills yeah. um uh, our ancestors are in us yeah and uh, one of my favorite quotes uh uh told to me by an elder was uh, you are your ancestors prayers made flesh so that that's that really speaks to me right yeah there. i love that saying yeah thank you for your words both of you um this was a really special conversation. I really um, enjoyed it, uh, like all of our conversations, but um, it was really nice to talk to both of you. It was a really fun conversation and, you know, important one. So mm -hmm. thank you both. Um, and I just wanted to oh, tell, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to tell Sarah that uh, <laughs> not that sacred. Wait, what? <laughs> No, I'm just teasing. I just wanted to say one quick thing about um, art. Our, our community is is um, humor yes. is a big part yeah. of healing, and and, uh, and uh, art is healing. Art is therapy. So it, you know, if if you need a release, maybe go tell some jokes. Uh, uh, maybe do some art or or um, follow Sarah because she's always telling jokes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. <laughs> oh, uh, on that uh, on that note, where could uh, oh, yes. our we people to ask. like uh, yeah. find you guys? Uh, your websites, your um, hashtags, your uh, handles, all handles, that stuff. all all that stuff. So my uh, heartberry dot com is my website. Heartberry Co. on we're on Instagram. We're on Heartberry on Facebook. We're on Twitter. So um, do you have a TikTok? You just put, <laughs> put the word Heartberry into the Googles. And there we are. Woohoo! Do you do you have a TikTok? Do you do the um, uh, dog face like coasting on the on the longboard with the uh, cranberry juice? No, I'm just kidding. You should. I feel like we should have a podcast just about him because he he hit me right here. He, yeah, like right I think here. he did that to everyone. That yeah. cranberry. I, there's so many things. Okay, yeah. but um, no, but TikTok would be awesome. We should do that. Maybe we'll add that in. <laughs> um, uh, if you come to Browning, you can find me on the street. <laughs> if you um, Google me, <laughs> Google John Pepion. No, no um, let's see. Uh, I'm I'm on uh, Facebook. Um, I'm on Instagram. Um, and then my website's always the same, uh, John Isaiah Pepion or just John Pepion. You can find me easily. Yep. P E P I O N. Um, thank you guys for sharing that and everyone go check them out because they have amazing art. Thank um, you. Yeah, seriously. Um, thank you guys again for talking with us. Um, 
and I hope we keep in touch. Yeah. Thank you, and thank you, Sarah. Miigwech. Thank you all. I'm going to take a selfie with you right now. Okay. You ready? Yes. <laughs> I love it, though. I love it. Uh, well, I'm going to leave you with a word that I recently learned in Ojibwe. Gigawabamin. See you later. Gigawabamin. <laughs> all right. Bye, guys. Bye. See ya. All right. Well, thanks for listening. I hope you learned some stuff, had fun. Uh, we sure did. <laughs> yeah, we did. Um, so, as always, uh, you can find out more information by checking out our website, www.asmudgeforyourthoughts.com. Uh, from there, you can find us and like us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Uh, we do not have a Twitter or TikTok yet. Actually, Just kidding, we do. We do, but we, do, we, we don't, don't really do anything. Anyway. <laughs> Moving on, if anyone, you or anyone you know would like to be on our podcast, um, there is a simple form on our website that you can fill out, um, just uh, contact information and the topic that you'd want to talk about, possibly, um, and then you could also just email us at contact at a smudge for your thoughts dot com. You can also Facebook inbox us. Um, yeah, we're pretty way, much open to any kind of conversation. You can call us up. Just kidding. You probably don't have our number. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we would like to thank Mary Kay for designing our logo. Mm -hmm. And we'd like to shout out eighth generation for our backdrop. Now they did not provide this to us. We just really love what they stand for. They are inspired natives, not native inspired. Just like the individuals we spoke to today. Mm -hmm. They are part yep. of that. Yep. And thank you, Okimauki Hugh, for uh, the songs in our intro. intro. Mm -hmm. All right. With that, Gigawabamin. Gigawabamin. See you later. <laughs> Gigawabamin. I was going to say, see you later. It's okay. Nah. <laughs>